My dad was a farmer. He lived for his farm and his family. Very uncomplaining. Always did the best by all of us. Always positive. If somebody asked for help, my dad would always, always try and help. Yeah, he was just my dad. He was first diagnosed in April and was, well, he was taken in as an emergency case. Initially, they thought he'd got appendicitis um, and then they found um, a tumour. Um, so he was operated, it actually happened to be over Easter weekend, actually. So he was operated on over Easter weekend, but all pretty successfully, apart from the after effects of the operation. Um, so, yeah, and he, he was recuperating at home and yeah, he, he was on, well on the road to recovery. Being on the farm, harvest was in full swing in the summer. And uh, I remember he was, he was very pleased with himself that he'd managed to move 200 bales of straw that, uh, you know, that summer. And uh, he felt he'd sort of, he was back to his normal self. He was doing really well and we, we, we thought he got my dad back basically, you know, we thought it's okay, everything's going to be alright. I think about six weeks after the operation he saw um, the surgeon and she suggested that he had um, belt and braces chemotherapy to make sure that there was no, uh, no cancer cells left. So he, his first appointment with uh, an oncologist was at mid to end of June. And he said that uh, he's, he was suggesting capacitabine treatment, which um, meant, actually, it, I, I felt very mixed about it because it was only going to increase Dad's chances by 3%. He had an 85% chance of being okay without the treatment. But the oncologist said that if he had the chemotherapy that it would increase his chances by about 3%. And I asked the oncologist at this appointment, because he was, he, was, he was quite blasé about the treatment and saying it was just tablets, it wasn't infusions, he could, you know. And so I said, well, if, if my dad doesn't get on with this treatment, I said, can he just stop it at any point? And he said, yes, absolutely. He said, yeah, if he doesn't get on with it, he can just come off it. It's not a problem. He went back and they collected the tablets so he, the, he took them that night, I think by the following morning, or certainly by the following evening, he'd started feeling very sick, um, and I think he had diarrhoea as well at that point. Um, and it just went downhill from there. Um, so I think he started them, it's been five days, he, he started them maybe the Tuesday evening, and by the Sunday, the following Sunday night, he was in hospital. Um, and so that was literally five days. They told him in hospital on that Sunday to stop taking them. N nobody at that point mentioned DPD deficiency or anything. Um, they, they just said, thought he was dehydrated because he had terrible, terrible sores in his mouth and down his throat. Um, and they, yeah, they they just said he was dehydrated and once the drug got out of his system, they thought he'd be fine. So he was in for about 24 hours and sent home again on the Monday. By the Wednesday, he was no, well, no better. He was actually a lot, lot worse. We had a local GP, local GP come out to see him. I think by the Thursday, he had, uh, which he hadn't told my mum because obviously he was, he, he didn't know how to explain it or how to say to my mum. Turned out he had skin peeling off his scrotum and uh, his skin was just starting to fall off. But by four o'clock in the morning, the Saturday morning, so that was um, coming up to a week after he'd stopped taking the drug, um, I got a phone call from my mum to say that his breathing had changed and she'd called an ambulance and um, he, he got blue lighted into um, Chichester um, at four or five o'clock on that Saturday morning. And we still believed then they, they had to, they, they took me in and I remember, you know, kissing my dad on the head and saying, oh, it's, it's all right, You're, you know, they've got to get you to the right place and they'll get you better. And um, he never came home. And um, I went down, I followed the ambulance down. We went into a &E with him and he was lying there and he was in 
you know, his skin and everything was just, he was just in such an awful state. Um, nobody, nobody had any recognition about how serious the situation was until later that day when they decided to move him to the acute oncology ward at Portsmouth. And <laughs> some of the last words I said to my dad was that um, I was, he was lying there. He just, yeah, he, he, he just was feeling so ill, wasn't he? And I just said to him, Dad, I said, are you feeling shit, Dad? And he said, not as good as that. And that was pretty much the last words because the following day when I saw him, we left there about 11 o'clock. My mum and my brothers were down there the next morning. We went down about lunchtime. By mm. that time, he was put on a ventilator and he was moved to intensive care. And we spent the next two weeks there with Dad, watching him die. And we went in on the Tuesday. We saw an oncology registrar and he said, we think we know what it is. He said, I've seen this before and your dad has, you know, we think he has a DPD deficiency, which means the, the capacitamine is poisoning him. And from then on, my dad basically laid in ITU, having probably thousands of pounds spent on him, trying to save him, tubes coming out of everywhere. And meanwhile, his skin was basically rotting. And I don't even, now I look back, I don't even know how we thought we had any hope, to be honest. So we were there for the whole two weeks. Um, until it came to a point in the, the, the sort of weekend two weeks later and um, everything was failing. I see everything. And uh, there was no coming back. We were all very, very angry that something like this could happen without you even knowing that was a risk with what you were taking. And certainly if my dad had known that was, was a risk, he'd have paid to have the test. He wouldn't have, he, he wouldn't have risked that. He would have paid the money. He should make you aware of the risk and then it's the patient's choice and that was denied. To us, that's just wrong, very wrong. And the health care and authorities should be taking action. Yeah. We'd just like everyone to be offered the test before they start treatment. Two years on, there's much more comprehensive tests available and deaths like my dad are completely avoidable and can even tell you if you, you can have the treatment but survive it, but more importantly they tell you if you die from it. And if my dad had had that test, he'd still be here today. <laughs>